Hello everyone. Um, this video contains some ideas I had regarding uh, poetry interpretation. Um, there is this YouTube channel Empire of the Mind and this is somebody who's usually commenting on cultural phenomena like uh, themes in art, literature, movies. And he did an excellent interpretation of a poem. It's an Old Norse poem. I think it's Old Norse, it's Old Anglo-Saxon. I don't know if it, that's the same language. <laughs> Tolkien would know, because this poem is the monologue of a warrior who has lost his tribe and is wandering the earth aimlessly in sorrow. So Empire of the Mind has um, analyzed the emotional layers in it how realistically it is portraying the feelings of the lyrical self. And he has pointed out how this was an important source of inspiration for J.R.R. Tolkien. For example, the term Middle Earth comes specifically from this poem and Tolkien. I think on his graduation speech, or I don't even know what a valedictorian speech is, but <laughs> he used it in in a festive uh, event, this poem, and um, it contained obviously a lot of meaning for him. And now there is this thing with poetry, it's almost a forgotten art. Do you know anybody who can recite a poem? Like, song texts might be something meaningful to somebody. Like they're in a stressful situation, something unknown is coming at them, or, I don't know, getting ready for an exam, birth of a child, death, death of a parent is imminent, something big like that, and you're alone with your thoughts. And there might be some lines, there might be some lines that occur to you. A song text. Poetry is usually not among that, but Song texts are, in some sense, what poetry has evolved to, because poetry started as musically designed text, rhythmically structured and accompanied by string instruments. Lyra. That's a lyre. I mean, not somebody who's not telling the truth, but the instrument lyre. Um, that is meant to be played while reciting. So this poem, The Wanderer, was very meaningful to J.R.R. Tolkien. And it was a kernel of inspiration for The Lord of the Rings. And I think for most of his, um, for most of his works of prose and poetry that are set in Middle-earth. Um, this YouTuber, Empire of the Mind, also pointed out that the Wanderer shows us an alien world. So, probably it's best if I like, describe the poem in short. Um, it's a monologue by a warrior from some Germanic tribe. It's not specified which tribe, but in the 6th and 7th century, people look back at the European migration period. Roman Empire had fallen at the end of the 5th century. And like in Britain, the Romans left in the year 409, never to return. Am I recording? Great. <laughs> Technical things must be made sure to work. So, the Romans had left in 409 and civilization had collapsed and different kingdoms arose, but usually they never amounted to much tried to imitate the past, but everything was in clear decline. So this wanderer is somebody who remembers feasts, he remembers kings and warriors, horses and armor, which are signs of economical health in antiquity. To feed a horse is expensive. If you have horses, it means you are doing well economically. It's a bit like it's a bit like having a good car, like you're not riding a donkey, you're riding a horse, it's a stately animal. 
if you have expensive mail, you have great tools or even weapons of steel, it means you can, you can rely on the work of specialized craftsmen. And this, this wanderer has somehow lost his tribe. The tribe seems to be extinct, like completely wiped out in war or disbanded. Some of those tribes, like we shouldn't imagine they are all ancestral groups, like there is some family and it's growing big in ancestors and then you have 10,000 people called the, the Goths because there was grandfather Goth, Goth and he had that many children. There is, there is usually like people in an area who group together often with a common language. But they are, the Germanic tribes especially are a bit like political parties. Like people give themselves a name like Alla, Alemanni, we are all men. Or the Franks, we are the brave ones. Goths are the good ones. So some of those names are actually telling names and they also tell us that people voluntarily entered those units. Okay, so this guy has lost his tribe, he's wandering. And he, uh, he starts to philosophize on the nature of the nature of civilization and mankind's role in the course of history. And to him, the outlook is bleak. He has seen, on the first glance, perfectly working societies disband, turn into ashes, like gone, what does it say, like gone like the waves or something. There is a memory of past glory but everything seems doomed to fail and decay. Now, it is, how to say it, it's good to have artifacts like that survive until today. Like these are the so-called dark ages. <laughs> these are like the parts of the middle ages that are most, most properly described as times of decline. Rome has crumbled to a feeding ground for cattle, like sheep are grazing on the Forum Romanum. But people still remember Caesar. They still take marble from the broken temples to build them into churches. But they have become unable to reproduce them. So, they are surrounded by the ruins of a civilization whose downfall nobody was able to stop and whose works they are unable to recreate. The, this surrounding must have, um, must have an interesting effect on how people view the world aesthetically and what they value. For example, for romantic reasons today, you can reject industrial mass production and you can come to value DIY projects or handmade stuff, traditional ornaments. That, that's a nice flavor, but usually we expect the future to be better. If we, if we hope for, I don't know, a better sword, no, not really, a better weapon, if we hope for better means of transportation, we wouldn't wish for the past to be preserved better. We would do the exact opposite. We would question the ideas of the past, dismantle them, try to rearrange them in a better way, because that's what has worked so marvelously for, let's say, 200 years, like since the 19th century, the, s the steps of technological progress have been so fast and vast that for the first time in the last 2000 years, we have really stopped looking back at the last empire that crumbled, the Roman, but looked into the future and imagined like things like Star Wars with planetoid bases. 
not built in Roman style, but in our brutalist industrial style. And poetry like The Wanderer, or even Lord of the Rings, <laughs> is utterly out of place in a society that is growing. And I think that's what makes it so, so important to have like this poem analyzed to really uh, point at the thing that is interesting, which is that in a society in decay, your thinking starts to shift and the things you value are different. And it's also an important, to say it, it's an, it's an important thought to take away to, to understand Tolkien's aesthetical and like artistic decisions better. Um, when I for the first time read The Silmarillion, I, I disliked its, its philosophy of history. Because I thought history is, is much more... History should be viewed with more optimism and the future is undoubtedly greater than the past. So this is a, an interesting inversion. I found it interesting because it was so diametrically opposed to my own views. And the views of most people today, I guess. For example, the greatest works are always at the beginning. And there is nothing that surpasses them in the coming generations. And if you are a little bit scientifically minded, that sounds utterly preposterous. <laughs> the... Okay, not to slight the dwarves, because Durin might have been like the first living being running around. But the elves, at least to the plan, plan of Eru Iluvatar, the creation god in the Silmarillion, the elves are the first intelligent beings to arise. They build a civilization and they are undying, like they are deathless. They start with bodily perfection. This <laughs> is as much anti-evolution as you can possibly be. Somebody just plans an ideal humanoid organism puts it somewhere, and they thrive. <laughs> Quite unbelievable. But it fits well to this antique mindset. Many civilizations of antiquity thought that all their crafts had been either invented by a god or like by some brilliant guys in the past, and the best you can do is preserve their knowledge. But the imperfections of human interaction bring a tendency to decay with them. So you might, Euclid might have, might have discovered everything in the space of geometry. But his student is not as bright as him. He teaches somebody who cannot be as bright as Euclidius because he didn't get it from the source directly. And then over generations, the knowledge of geometry declines. If you're in the Middle Ages and you look at art, specifically like sculpture, the decline is obvious. The, there are those like philosopher artists, like I think it was Polyclet. I might be wrong there, but he wrote a treatise on the geometry of sculpture, which proportions are the most pleasing to the eye. And like people like Polyclet wrote in the spirit that they had gained final knowledge, sometimes from the gods themselves. I think it was Parmenides who had the vision that the goddess Dike, who stands for, I think, justice, 
had given him a vision like here this is this is the final philosophy write it down <laughs> just get it right and you are done with it um how oh, was i getting with that <laughs> my mind is wandering quite far in that regard yeah so the idea in antiquity is that there is an absolute source of knowledge some people have found it in visions from the gods or in like mysterious visions and and you have this platonic world where you get a vision of the good itself from the source you see it with a disembodied eye with your spirit alone and then when you enter the material world the view muddies so the Platonic heaven of ideas is a place where the soul sees all things in their true nature, which means you you see a thing that is absolutely according to an eternal definition. Some kind of museum of all things. And the soul without body sees colors truer than the eye can perceive. Like that's how it's described. And it sees all those things. Then it incarnates. <laughs> it starts forgetting because it has. It's, yeah, it's also compared to how water can. How to say it? Hmm. You see less sharp in water. You see sharper in air, and the gods are in space. And they had this cool intuition that air actually makes things less sharp. So without air, they can see better. <laughs> it's pretty cool. But this is the same mindset that Tolkien has woven into his world. I think the best example are the Silmarils. Uh, Feanor, who is like an seen the first or second generation of all elves to be born at all i think he's the second generation or something like that he's the son of the of the high king of the nord or the first one forgot his name but he he creates emeralds hope that's the right term for like <laughs> polished precious crystals, um, faceted stones that are the pinnacle of art. And also in that case, Tolkien is drawing from an antique vision where art means expert craftsmanship that is according to the vision of the creator, like the craftsman. In antiquity, people said something is beautiful when it worked. So the craftsman wanted to build a bridge and the bridge is exceptionally well fitted to its use. Then it's beautiful. I mean, Beatus or Felix in Latin. I think in Greek it's Kalos, but I don't speak any ancient Greek, so <laughs> might pretty well be wrong. Now those Silmarils are on a technical level unsurpassed in all of history in Tolkien's Middle Earth ever since. And at the same time rival the stars in beauty. And for a modern reader that's something so unacceptable. I mean, can you imagine living in the sure knowledge that there are some artifacts whose splendor we cannot hope to recreate. Like Roman statues somewhere, clearly um, broken, like there's an arm missing. But still, with an arm missing, you wouldn't be able to make a better one. You don't know anybody who could make a better one. And you think it's quite likely that no one ever will reach that level again. Like that's, 
I don't know if these are like end time visions, but it's not that hard to say. I I was about to say that for for most of the lifespan of humanity, that was the standard vision, and it could be right because we have been living on traditions that brought down tools for millions yeah let's say millions of years like i don't know how conscious australopithecus i don't know how that sounds in english australopithecus <laughs> I don't know. um how conscious those those hairy early hominids were about the like ancestry of their tools or something but um, there are some tools we inherited from neanderthal craftsmen and with inherited i mean uh, the art of creating them for example um, i don't know the english word but there is a tool called ale which pokes a hole into leather <laughs> it's quite trivial but quite useful if you live in an arctic environment <laughs> Um, this tool seems to have come down to the European Homo sapiens by Homo neanderthalensis that have been living there far longer. So if you live in a society where you need to learn a lot of things, but none of the things you learn has been invented by somebody. You start getting the idea that this is not something that people usually do, which is true, and that, that people cannot do. So you get ideas like the Egyptians said about the god Tot, Thoth. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really not sure how to pronounce things whose pronunciation I do not know in German quite well <laughs> to do in English, but... <laughs> The Egyptians believed in a god that gave them all their knowledge. So this god just came up with writing and things like that. Because the time since writing was invented was so far in the distance that they couldn't remember any names or couldn't even imagine how it was done. So our modern time, I think, to just close this thought here, is quite unusual in that it is ascendant. Until recently we were growing in numbers, which is unusual in history. Like you would you would have to look very closely to realize that actually the number of people is increasing between the year zero and one thousand. People surely thought it was not the case. <laughs> I mean, in fact, if you live in the ruins of an urban society like the Roman society, which was planting cities everywhere where none had been before and where none had been after it, you would get the idea that the Roman Empire was the height of population numbers and that the Middle Ages were just a decline. I mean, in fact, that was not the case. Um, cities have the tendency to decrease the birth rate. So they grow by immigration. That's how the Romans did it. They said, here, Colonia Agrippina, this tribe, this tribe, go in. And then their numbers de declined. But the countryside was empty. And like barbarians for, century look, for centuries looked at those empty lands and said, like, hey, settle. Like <laughs> the, the Teutons and Kimberns, I should have looked up how... No, I, I, I couldn't have known I would talk about them. <laughs> because I didn't plan most of this comment. But uh, the invasion of the Teutonic and Cimbrian tribes in the year like 120 before Christ, something around that, um, was also a quest for land. They thought, hey, northern Italy looks pretty empty. Would be cool. We will settle here. Deal. No. <laughs> and like that had been going on since the end of the empire. Ah yeah, this is this is another important distinction here that is also important for the aesthetics of the Lord of the Rings especially. 
Silmarillion is too too much bird's eye view to say much about that, but Tolkien's world is rural. If you have an urban civilization, chances are you are either ascending or declining. <laughs> but you probably have barbarian ancestors whose tech level you are surpassing. And that's just a function of population density, I guess. So if you have a lot of people in one place, you start doing a lot of division of labor. And somebody who has struck iron for 30 years know how to listen to the steel to make a good blade. And if you are one of those Germanic tribesmen who go with an axe into the forest and come home with a with with the axe and a throwing axe, it's cool because you can DIY your weaponry. But how often will you do that? Like two times? Three times? So there is not a lot of accumulation of experience and like those let's say DIY weapons look the part they are they're not comparable to like ceremonial centurion armor of Roman times or something like that where you can see faces fake hair in bronze and like <laughs> you, you you wouldn't DIY that because you you have cattle to feed and and, and neighbors to fend off and like it's just too much going on on such a farm yeah and like there are those few fabled cities who represent a pinnacle of civilization but the rest is quite rural the hobbits are rural and rural descends into uninhabited <sighs> now what was it Anuminas, I think. It's it's north of the Shire, I think. There are the ruins of Anuminas. Not not quite sure, but so there was a kingdom. There are big ruins, towers, and now wolves, trolls. Nothing. Yeah. So all of those thoughts coalesced around this interpretation of this simple poem, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> and um, if you would want to create something with the same aesthetic, same flavor of strange morality and, and strange outlook to the world, Without being irrational or erratic, then looking at the wanderer is a good source of inspiration. Yeah, and as I've said, I will put the link to this interpretation in the description below. And I'll pray that this recording has worked. <laughs> Thanks a lot.